Okay, so welcome everyone. This is another in my series of crossing the boundary interviews, conversations uh, with people who have crossed boundaries of um, ethnic identity or uh, psychological thinking or spiritual uh, involvement and uh, are doing something to make the world better as well from their new understandings. And um, uh, today I have the pleasure to uh, introduce and speak with, now you're going to have to tell me, I forgot to ask, <laughs> what did, how do you say your first name? Well, the first name is actually uh, pronounced Koroi, but Koroi. most people uh, just oh, some call me Cuff. Right, I come to been calling you Cuff and I, and I forgot the real name. It's Koroi Ferguson, uh, who... Uh, is the president of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, has been since 2006, when he uh, was the first uh, person of color, first African-American to, to be that. And he has uh, since been the president or co-president for uh, an unprecedented number of years. He's also an associate editor of the National and International Journal of Humanistic Psychology. He's a PhD in psychology from Boston College and is a tenured uh, full professor and past dean of the College of Public and Community Service at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's the co-founder of two visionary organizations called Interculture Incorporated and Associates in Human Understanding. He's uh, active as an organizational development consultant and workshop facilitator. He's published quite a few books and articles uh, on a wide range of very interesting subjects, which we will hopefully get into at least uh, some of them. There are so many. Um, one of his books is called The Evol Evolving the Human Race Game, A Spiritual and Soul-Centered Perspective. Another one is Transitions in Consciousness from an African-American Perspective. A New Perspective, another book, A New Perspective on Race and Color, Research on an Outer versus Inner Orientation to Anti-Black Dispositions. He's written Archetypal Energies as the Creative Urges Behind the Ev Evolution of Humanistic Psychology and Positive Psychology, Eight Perspectives for Staying Grounded When the World Seems Insane. And I just want to note, again, a correspondence uh, to some of my own work. I, I, I did a series of uh, Zoom webinars that are on my YouTube channel. Uh, called uh, Staying Sane While Making the World Better. And uh, so we're, we're on the same wavelength there. Uh, another article is called Healing Our Race-Linked Wound. <clears throat> and so on. Well, undoing racism, archetypal energies, race relations, and decolonizing the anti-Black mind, racist mind. So, and there are more. And I encourage everyone to uh, just Google uh, Cuff and uh, you'll find some of the articles are available and, and books are certainly available through the usual sources. So, so Cuff, again, thank you for doing this with me, taking the time. And uh, let me start by just asking you, what are your roots? Where did your parents come from? What was your childhood? where did you grow up and especially uh, interested of course in how your early uh, experiences uh, involved anything related to what you're currently involved with with spirituality and psychology and and consciousness studies okay well let me first thank you for for having me uh, on the program and uh, be happy to share whatever thoughts uh, occur to me and um, and hopefully they may have some meaning uh, to someone. <laughs> um, as far as my background, I actually grew up uh, in what most people refer to as the segregated South, mm -hmm. with all of what that means. Uh, 
sitting on having to sit on the back of the bus, <laughs> not being uh, allowed to to go in the front doors of the bus, uh, having to um, if I went downtown, uh, couldn't go into the front doors of uh, movie theaters. We had to go into a a side entrance uh, that went up to the balcony. A uh, lot of the people know that those were the best seats, but <laughs> but that was the experience. Where was that, Carl? Where were Pardon? you? Where were you? This was in Columbia, South Carolina. South Carolina. South Carolina, yeah. And um, other experiences, uh, I mean, I literally grew up with an experience where, um, you know, you saw, uh, saw the signs. Uh, if I went to, um, uh, in a public place where there were water fountains, uh, seeing signs colored and white. Uh, of course, if I drank from the white water fountains, I would subject, subject to arrest. <laughs> So those were those were kind of experiences, and I actually literally, literally lived one block from an all um, white school at the time, and uh, couldn't go there, and had to be bused all the way across town to an all black uh, junior high and high school. Now, uh, some people may uh, think that. Uh, I may have come out of that experience uh, angry, and I didn't. <laughs> Actually, I came out of that experience curious. I was curious about why people would construct such a reality. What, what, hap what had to be going on in people's minds in order to have that kind of reality to exist? And so a lot of what propelled a lot of my um, subsequent work was to try to understand that kind of question. How did people put together the world in such a way that uh, there were all of these demarcations, which uh, were pretty arbitrary? Uh, why, did, why was there a, a kind of a consciousness at play that, uh, that fueled that dynamic, and then how can you go about healing it? So um, I did. I did, and I must have add that uh, growing up, I actually also was exposed to uh, many many uh, folks in the community um, where there was a lot of nurturing going on. So the community itself was a very loving, nurturing community. Uh, it was an all black community, but it was very nurturing. And it, it was as if uh, um, you had extended family all over the place <laughs> and you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> so we had, uh, we had one of the stories I'm fond of telling is around um, something we call the grapevine. Um, which was very strong. If, if you understand that as a cultural dynamic, it means that uh, information gets shared quickly uh, uh, from per person to person. So one of the experiences, for example, that I had as a, when I was in uh, undergrad school <laughs> was to, um, uh, I was asked to do this little talk at a church and um, my grandmother was not there. And so I finished the talk uh, and I went immediately to my grandmother's house. And as I got there, she said, oh son, I heard you said, <laughs> she told me everything that I had talked about <laughs> at, at this, uh, this church uh, gathering. Uh -huh. So the grapevine, <laughs> the grapevine was very, very strong. Somebody had showed up and Told everything that I had said. So anyway, but that was that I was, was beginning my... to think maybe she was very psychic, and you were <laughs> no. Well, that there are elements. Uh, maybe perhaps that was going on too. But uh, uh, she was she was sort of gifted in the sense of um, being very wise. Mm -hmm. And in the community, uh, 
we talk, we often talk about, and I grew up with this notion of what, what was called mother wit. And that was just a way to, a short version of talking about um, uh, wisdom. Wisdom so, of, the, of the woman. Of the woman, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we said, we talked, we call it mother wit. Mm. And so my grandmother was very, very, um, had lots of gifts around mother wit. Mm. Um, she would be able to say things, uh, understand things, comprehend things, even without uh, a lot of education. Uh, she didn't even finish finish elementary school, and that was it. <laughs> uh, but uh, the knowledge that she um, somehow managed to put together and was able to comprehend the world in a particular way. Uh, it was very, very uh, helpful to me as a, a growing up, uh, and I literally grew up actually with um, in an extended family, um, where I talk about uh, having at least three mother figures. Mm. It was my biological mother, an aunt uh, who lived in the same household with her children, and my my grandmother uh, who was kind of like the. Uh, uh, the the matriarch of the family. Anyway, that's a little bit about my background. Oh, no. So, so uh, in a way, I, I'm I'm thinking you were pretty exceptional in uh, not having anger but curiosity, and um, I wonder where your curiosity took you. Like, when did you begin to think along the lines that you now? think in terms of consciousness and uh, human beings being multi-dimensional beings and, and so forth. Did you, did you get involved with any particular schools of training or teachers, anything like that? Well, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Uh, my journey around that, um, I was always curious. But I didn't do a lot of deep dive around it until probably when I got into graduate school. Um, and I, I was exposed at that time to, at the time, was, was personal growth types of um, issues. And, um, and then I, I, I recall going to a, um, um, a conference it was a conference of the Association of Black Psychologists uh, that was taking place in Boston at the time. And there was a woman there who was giving a presentation around uh, the inner life and consciousness and so forth. And um, which piqued my curiosity, it, it sort of piqued my curiosity at the time. So I went up afterwards and talked to her and what she said to me at the time was, can, she said, can I do a reading of you? <laughs> and I went, a reading? What do you mean? <laughs> uh -huh. So she said some things that I thought were pretty kind of interesting, but, um, you know, sort of like I, 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 I was sort of like on the outside looking in at, at these, uh, these issues. And so then she recommended, she said, you know, you may want to get a hold of this book. And it was interesting how I heard the title of the book at the time. Um, it was, uh, I heard the book as Self Speaks. Seth. Self Speaks, yeah. Yeah, yeah I get it. So I then, I then went, you know, looking at all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. bookstores trying to find this, this book called Self Speaks. And, um, uh, now prior to this, I should back up and say that prior to this, um, um, I had actually had some consciousness expanding experiences mm -hmm. and I didn't have words to explain them to myself. Um, a little more about what they were, what triggered them or anything? Well, it was being very, very close to a small group of people at the time. Mm -hmm. And my experience at the time uh, was that I had actually two. 
where literally my consciousness just expanded so that I felt like I was, mm. we were part of the same consciousness. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, everything around me, I felt a sense of oneness with. Uh, now, I, I didn't take any drugs or anything like that, but it was just, and it came out of just deep conversations I was having at the time. Um, and it, and to be honest with you, it was like, well, wait a minute, whoa, what's happening here? <laughs> you know, because I didn't have language to explain it to me, which is which is one of the things that actually triggered me to to go and talk to this woman who was talking about some things that that seemed to be in alignment with with those consciousness expanding experiences. And so when she said that there was this book. I went, well, maybe that will give me some language, mm -hmm. you know, to to understand what I was experiencing. And so I, I went to all of these different bookstores and I went to the psychology sections, you know, trying to find this book, uh, Self Speaks, and I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I know then, what you're talking about. It had a big impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, know, I know you understand where I'm going with this. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, that was I gave up looking. Uh, but then something deep inside said, "Well, you know, continue to look." So go to this one store, and so I went there, and I went to the psychology section. I still couldn't find it, and I was just about to leave when there was like this inner urge, inner voice that says, uh, "Ask this teller here." Mm -hmm. So I asked the teller. I said, "You know, I've been looking for this book all over the place." I can't find it anywhere in the psychology sections. And it's called Self Speaks. And then the person thought for a second, he went, oh, you must mean Seth Speaks. <laughs> and he said, this is it's a pretty popular book right now, uh, it, but it's not in the psychology section. It's in the occult section. <laughs> and I went, occult? <laughs> OK. So um, so I was taken aback a little bit at first, but then I decided to buy the book and um, and I started reading it. Um, it was the Seth material and then the nature person reality. And I found words that were what explained that those consciousness expanding experiences that I was having yeah. that, that I had had. And, um, and so I, I, I went on this inner journey hmm. Um, where I got a hold of just about all of the books that, uh, you know, the channeler for Seth, uh, Jane Roberts, uh, had, uh, had produced. And I was just reading and reading and reading. I was on my own little path to do that. And I was, I was also reading a lot of, and studying a lot of other psychology books, uh, to sort of create a balance there. Um. And I didn't talk about it with anybody. You know, this was my own, own inner path and my own inner journey. Um, then at some point along the way, people who were on a similar path began to show up uh, in my space and uh, began to have some conversations around commonalities, um, some experiences they had, and... Uh, uh, and uh, and I began then to do some some research um, to sort of put some science behind uh, the uh, material that I encountered in in the uh, the, the Seth uh, books. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that I read in in the Seth books said how people think about the nature of their inner life or the nature of the unconscious matters when they are, are dealing with race relations, particularly black white race relations. And it went on to say, uh, when people have a fear of the nature of the unconscious uh, as this dark, unknown part of the self, then that's what gets projected out onto the black race and they rail against it. 
And I thought that was very interesting, but there was no science behind it. <laughs> so I decided at that point that I was going to see if I could create a, uh, a, a research study to try to find out whether or not there was any, if, if I could put some science behind the esoteric material that I had encountered. Um, and uh, the results of that was actually the, the book, uh, A New Perspective on Race and Color. Mm. Right. Wow, great, yeah. great story. So in, in effect, uh, you were on a path leaving behind some of your old belief systems in a way, opening to new experiences. Uh, you write a, a good bit about dogma and how what, what you compare to evolutionary science. Uh, I understand that you mean by dogma, I think a mindset or of beliefs that come from some authority and that are definitive and unquestionable and uh, these are the truth, that's dogma. And many people compare that to science. Why do you compare it? Why do you use the term evolutionary science? What do you mean by that as compared? Do you thinking science itself, as we know it, is a dogma? <clears throat> well, I mean, I what I uh, began to try to reframe was the idea that science itself is a uh, is an evolutionary process. In other words, there's no def you don't get to a place and say this is. This is, uh, this is it. <laughs> this is the total truth around things. And so, although that's a way that many people want to look at science as if it's a, uh, a static thing, you get to a point and that's the total truth and so forth. Yeah. So I began to use the, the words evolutionary science as a way to talk about how science itself continues to evolve. Okay. Uh, as we evolve and as we begin to understand and learn new things uh, uh, science sometimes we're ahead of science sometimes science is a little bit ahead of us but it's a kind of a co-creative process um and uh i used i i got into trying to look at dogma uh, because these are this is kind of like what sometimes folks fall into or fall prey to particularly during times of stress, uh, they want somebody to tell them, <laughs> you know, this is the way to, to deal with it. This is how to handle things, as opposed to kind of embracing their own uh, agency and their own uh, way of creating a new uh, and looking at even the stress as something that um, is really trying to move them to a different place. Um, and can be looked at as, a, as a, an impetus for growth. Um, and rather than simply looking outside of oneself for some scripts that says, uh, uh, this is how you, this is how you do it. Yeah. And I remember well, Obama got himself into some trouble because he was talking about the resistance to progressive ideas and, and change. And he said something about the people, you know, revert back to their religion and guns, you know, and, and then people, yeah. there was a big uproar about it and he had to apologize. Right. And, but essentially uh, it's, it's that, isn't it? That there is this resistance that comes from our clinging to old ways of seeing things and, and uh, understanding things. W would you say that it's even a matter of, um, in some ways going beyond the thinking mind itself, like certainly in, in Buddhist uh, and meditation uh, approaches, we, we talk about that, that, that it's, it's not just a change from one kind of set of thoughts to another, it's even going beyond thoughts. Is that yeah, um, it is, uh, and I, and I, sort of in alignment with that. Um, and I think more of the energy behind the thought. <laughs> uh, you you talk about archetypal energies and like the higher vibrational forces that, that are in us, 
but that we're sometimes closed off to, that you know, yes. we're open to through methods that, that are available to us. Yes, yes. I do. Uh, Talk a little yeah. bit about that, yeah, what you sure. mean by archetypal energies. And... Sure. I, I, uh, um, how I kind of view archetypal energies is just these higher vibrational energies mm -hmm. that operate deep, deep within our psyches at both individual and collective levels that lead us toward our optimal selves and optimal realities. So they all have these um, uh, qualities to them that uh, when we're in touch with them, um, uh, we, be, we begin to experience them in our own unique way. So for example, uh, I even say love, I speak about love as one of the archetypal energies. And what I mean by that is that when somebody says, uh, I love you, what they may be saying is that when I'm in your presence, I'm in touch with the love inside of me. <laughs> and so, and it's, and I think about those, all of the archetypal energies as having that kind of um, vibrational tone to them. But each one of us experienced them in our own unique way. So you know what the love vibration feels like inside of you. I know what it feels like inside of me. Um, but it comes from a, a higher vibrational sp uh, space uh, that we can tap into when we open our minds uh, and hearts um, to that, that level of vibration. Um, and so when I, and so it comes from, for me, like a spiritual space. Um, and I, when I, when I'm talking to some of my classes, for example, I, they ask me, what do you mean by spirit? <laughs> spirit. And I said, well, I'm really not talking about religion. Uh, I'm really talking about vibrational energies and levels of vibrational energies and so forth. And I like to use the, the metaphor of uh, ice. And so, you know, all of, in many ways, uh, everything around us is nothing but energy uh, vibrating at certain frequencies. Uh, the lower the frequency, the more dense something is, the higher the frequency, the less dense something is. And so if you think about ice, um, most people will say, well, that's kind of, kind of solid because if i threw through the ice at you and hit you with it you're going to go ouch <laughs> um but then if i applied some energy to the ice in the form of uh, heat uh and i say what happens to it well it speeds up the vibrational uh things that happen and it changes form changes from this apparent uh, solid thing to now a liquid form. And then they say, well, okay, suppose I apply uh, a little bit more heat to it in the form of, uh, I mean, more energy to it in the form of, of heat. What happens to it then? Well, it speeds up the, it speeds up the frequencies again and, um, and it changes form. I said, well, uh, now, is what what form is it taking? I said, well, it's sort of in this gaseous state. So is it, can you still, can you see it now? And then the answer would be, well, no. <laughs> For a little bit, I can see it, but not, but I can't. So suppose now then you think about uh, spirit and spiritual beings as vibrating at this higher frequency that at least currently we're not able to see you know with our physical senses at the moment uh some of us can but <laughs> but to um uh and so uh, but they're vibrating at a higher frequency you know than than uh than we're currently used to experiencing so uh i use that as a way to try to get well, students to think about good. spirit I, I i use that a lot that same metaphor with some of my 
people I work with. And I, I like to think of the, uh, you know, physically you think of the sun can do that to ice. Yes. It just happened right out here in the last couple of days. We had ice yes. <laughs> and then we had uh, water flowing and then uh, it all evaporated up into the, right. so the sun does that. And inwardly, I think of the soul as the sun yes. or spirit. And that's what can do it for um, tight uh, constellations of energy that manifest as uh, constriction or fear and pain and so forth. Right. Yeah. So how how does one and maybe if you want to how do you how did you come to uh, I'm thinking you experience these things not just learned about them in a book and then said oh that's a good idea uh, there's subtle energies and there's beings that exist at subtle energy levels and what kinds of practice or methods, if any, that you could tell us about that you yourself employed to enhance your own experience of, of this reality, this way of being in reality? That's a good question. And I don't know if I really have a good answer for you mm -hmm. um, because um, my my path for for coming to some places uh, is not necessarily about a um, a practice. <laughs> uh, it's more about uh, kind of what I just simply say: opening my mind <laughs> uh, and opening my soul. Um, and so how I get there is, you know, one may talk about it as, as deep meditation. Um, uh, my truth, however, is that it's, it's when I'm, when I allow, when I'm in quiet <laughs> and when I uh, kind of begin to listen to an inner voice um, that sort of speaks to me in a way and I honor that. That's what uh, what I began to uh, to either write about or share. Um, and, and indeed, um, this last book, uh, "Evolving the Human Race Game," was actually produced that way. Although, being in academia, <laughs> I changed the pronouns. <laughs> Uh, the way that, and I say this in the preface, you know, so, so I'm not really hiding it. Um, but for example, uh, the way that the book actually got produced was uh, what, what came across as, as if I was kind of exp having a, um, um, a joint experience with what I, you know, what people may call their higher self. <laughs> And it was like me and my higher self was writing this book together. So it's it spoke of it used the word we. So it said we would like for you to understand, like you to understand. So talk to the audience as you. And then if my ego personality sort of began to filter into that, it would call me the author. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, so the original text actually was written in that way. Mm. And, um, and it was out of these states, yeah. these all, you can call them altered states of consciousness that the book got produced. And then I went, well, you know, you're in academia right now. <laughs> Some people really may not necessarily understand that process. That's why the Jane Roberts book was in the occult section. Right? Exactly. We're exactly. trying, trying to write a book that psychologists are reading. Right. So I said, well, let me just, and I, for lack of a better way of talking, saying, talk about it, I also had a conversation with my higher self and say, was well, okay if I change these pronouns here? Mm -hmm. That's fine. <laughs> So I, I basically Wasn't attached to getting credit, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, so I basically change, you know, we to I, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, maybe drop you. <laughs> um, 
but what was interesting about this too is that when I when a, when that book was written, mm -hmm. I I also was curious because I I, mean, I did have the I, mean, I do have the academic training. Um, it didn't use any references, so I went and searched to see if there were any reference materials that actually could back up some of the things that were being said, mm -hmm. and I found all kinds of things that, that actually uh that were that, that i could use as references so you'll see in in that particular book for example that if i if i'm saying something if something's being said and there is a uh, there's literature that that seems to uh validate and verify it it's included in parentheses you know as, as a as a way of saying um, but the original version didn't have any of that. <laughs> it was interesting. That's great. Yeah. I want to, I want to jump to, uh, your uh, article that originally, uh, called, got me think, thinking to call you, uh, contact you, which was a, an article that appeared in, in the journal of the Association of Humanistic Psychology, uh, in which you described, uh, first, being somewhat um, uh, moved by David Bohm and his ideas about the implicate order. And then you described uh, something like what you're saying, like an inner conversation, only this inner conversation wasn't, so to speak, with your higher self. It was with the coronavirus. And it was, I, I'm not sure where in the trajectory of the, uh, our experience with the pandemic, as it's called, uh, took place, but I saw it, and I had been uh, compiling some articles myself and some of my own writing on a Medium site, Medium or with a, the app that you can get, uh, I called COVID Inspirations. It was my hope in the beginning of the early days of the pandemic that this was going to be a uniting force for humanity, because we would all be facing the same challenge. We were looking at our relationship to nature together. Of course, that was a very overly optimistic uh, assessment of what would happen, which turned out to be just another very polarizing and, and uh, you know, painful experience for a lot of us. So um, your article struck me, and uh, I'd just love to hear you talk about it. Of course, a skeptic would argue, I'm not one, that uh, this was your imagination. Um, but you described it as just out of curiosity, opening, what would it be like to have a conversation? I think that's how you said it, with the coronavirus, the intelligence of that. And elaborate on, on that, if you would, and, and what you found. Yeah. Um... It's kind of hard to put words on what my inner experience was like, um, but um, and that's why I use David Bohm um, in his framework of trying to talk about uh, the uh, the implicated and explicate order, uh, which in some people and many people talk about it as a morphic field that we're kind of tapping tap into. Like Rupert Sheldrake's. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So my inner experience, however, was was more about it, it was was literally kind of opening my mind. Mm -hmm. And again, those are words that I use uh, to try to describe what the experience was like. Uh, and it's hard to then have people to fully understand what that means to open your mind. Um, but it really does, in many ways, speak about how do you how do you let go of ego? <laughs> how do you even let go of personality structures? Uh, how do you let go of um, uh, scripts <laughs> that you've created uh, to be in this uh, kind of very deep open space to allow um whatever information 
that may be at a higher order to just simply come through and uh, without judgment and to see what it says to you. What does it speak? How, what voice does it have? And so it's in that kind of state that um, this inner dialogue, so to speak, took place. And it said what it wanted to say. And I recorded it, you know, wrote it out <laughs> uh, and tried to capture it as best that I, as best as I could. And that's what actually appears in the article. And that's why it's in quotes, <laughs> uh, because I don't I don't don't own it. <laughs> you know, per se, uh, it is a, is a dialogue uh, from from COVID. And as it said, uh, um, you know, we've given it a name <laughs> uh, and we've given it meaning uh, and it has its own consciousness that's very different than, than our consciousness uh, as human beings. But as uh, as a new entity that comes onto the landscape, uh, it's trying to survive like any other new entity that comes into to being, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that it's very aware that it needs our bodies in order to do that, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and speaks more about a uh, kind of a a learning process that both humanity and it is, is engaged in right now as a, as a way to try to um, learn how to live together, so to speak. So rather than, uh, um, and I think it says at one point that, yes, yeah, it's, it's continuing to evolve toward becoming more endemic as opposed to being a pandemic. Um, and as you know, most things, most of the, uh, what we call the diseases right now um, are more endemic than pandemic, uh, like the flu, <laughs> you know, we, it's endemic. Uh, so it comes back around yearly, but uh, we don't think about the flu right now as a, as a pandemic. Um, and so it it essentially essentially was talking about how it's e it's evolving as we are evolving that it's here you know to, to try to help us to <laughs> and it may be the ideal idealistic space that you're into too <laughs> of trying to help humanity to evolve uh, it's 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 level of consciousness so that we can. Uh, see ourselves as interdependent and uh, uh, and trying to mature uh, our consciousness. Uh, and what it reminded me when I actually reread it and went, oh, okay. Some of, some of the things that I've written about is how we are uh, kind of as a human species right now, um, trying to mature as a, in terms of our consciousness that we may be no. Very much at, a, at a, a young consciousness kind of phase of our development as a as a species, and now you uh, talk about energy shifts in terms of human, I think human experience and our collective experience on the planet. Uh, does does this fit in with that? That that this is part of what's coming from somewhere. That's that's sort of uh, shifting our own consciousness of how we are in relationship to the whole ecosystem that we live within? Yeah. Um, one of the more interesting things that, uh, that Einstein once said <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, you know, can't you cannot really solve a problem with the same kind of consciousness that created it? Um, and that's an interesting. It was an interesting proposition. Mm -hmm. But in many in many of the uh, uh, inner places that I've been, uh, the messages that I keep getting back is one of that that's what our 
the new struggle is about is how to evolve our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's more about, interesting enough, more about how to, to do that in such a way that we can learn how to grow with joy. Mm -hmm. And that right now, uh, like we have our PhDs in learning how to grow with pain. <laughs> we know how to do that, <laughs> you know, as a human species. Mm -hmm. um, we even have lots of different slogans, you know, having to do with that. No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. <laughs> and we reinforce those notions. So if we have that floating around in our individual and collective minds at some level, we're basically using the same kind of consciousness over and over and over and over again yeah. uh, that create the kind of dramas that we find ourselves in. And so it's like, how do we evolve out of that uh, to a different uh, kind of order uh, so that uh, uh, we're no longer playing the same game mm -hmm. uh, over and over and over again. That's not working. That's not serving us well at this point. Uh, and in order to do that, you know, the the work, I think, is, as you and me to the like many people know that the the real work initially comes from the inside. <laughs> Um, and it's when enough people who have done their work from the inside out that they then begin to manifest a different kind of consciousness. And when enough people are able to do that, yeah. um, it changes uh, the morphic field. It changes the morphic yeah. field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, there's so many things you have written about and have been involved in and, and I, I would like to give more time to each of them but one that is uh, very important uh, to all of us I think and you started really by when you were describing your growing up in South Carolina with um, some of your own experience with race and racial identity and uh, just the uh, kind of very talk about growing through pain, uh, this country's experience with dealing with race and maybe outside this country as well. And you've written extensively in very unique, very unique way, I think, about it. Um, and you talk about the uh, racial wounding that's ages old in, you, in human consciousness. So, um, I'd love to hear you talk some uh, in the limited time we have about what, what you can share with us about uh, from your wisdom and what you have learned from within and from observations of the world about what what is going on and how do we get out of this mess that we're in. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let me... Uh, I'm going to say something, but um, and then, and I think you know you probably will understand where, where I'm coming from. If I said you know that I I'm quite aware that I incarnated mm -hmm. as a black male, mm -hmm. <laughs> very conscious about that. Yeah, uh, and so part of part of what I what I know about why I'm here. <laughs> to try to make some kind of contribution uh, to healing, you know, a, um, a very deep wound mm -hmm. in the human psyche. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, the challenge has been, or one of the challenges has been how to translate and find language that tries to, to explore and help folks to, to help folks to explain, explore the nature of that wound uh, that doesn't scare the hell out of them uh, and doesn't traumatize them. So um, the, the, the deeper wound, you know, has a, can be traced way, way back uh, as I speak about it as when we became aware of being aware. 
and it yes, has all... I wondered what you meant by that. <laughs> it's it 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 um there's a lot to do then with with the notion of uh, how we initially experienced uh light and dark mm -hmm. and so when light began to uh, emerge that could cast awareness around something um uh it looked looked as if uh dark was uh was something that was unknown and it looked as if um, somehow because we emerged out of a and, and, and created as a species this duality way of thinking about things that we we forgot <laughs> that we all emerged out of the dark mm. and um in some ways necessarily so so that we could play some games and in the process of playing these games however we've forgotten all about where they came from uh and the wounds however uh, uh then has cast our consciousness into um three levels of being stuck at least the way that i've been able to discern them and to try to talk about them one has to do with the issue of then of security so we play a, we play a huge game around a human i call it a human race game a human uh, security race game where uh uh one uh, then is uh um really walking around in the world uh feeling very unsafe feeling very disconnected from the other <laughs> um very easily easy then to cast the other as an enemy uh getting engaged with lots of mechanistic ways of thinking about things and it then gets fueled into uh, the way in which we, we begin to think about light and dark. I mean, it, it permeates many cultural scripts. Uh, it permeates even how we think about higher spiritual beings. You know, so we may talk about like the God of light and and the Prince of Darkness, you know, in religion and Christianity. Um, and so it it frames then the way in which people construct certain kinds of realities, uh, and and it's the fear then. And I talk about this, and, and I haven't written a whole lot about it. But what I what I'm calling like the dark unknown archetype, and how it's gotten misused, uh, uh, misunderstood, and misused uh in terms of uh race relations uh and if you look around the globe you know in terms of of oppressed folks it's usually the folks who are darker complected uh and uh and a lot of that's being generated by that light and dark fear you know that's going on around the nature of the of the inner life now, interesting enough, this this is kind of like what the Seth material was talking about too, uh, where I started that journey. <laughs> um, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Does the light dark error, if you will, of equating that with somehow the skin color uh, exist, or even the light dark association with good and evil? Do you feel that's that exists in shamanic cultures and in, among indigenous people, or is it more of a Christian, Jewish, Christ, maybe Jewish, uh, Christian, uh, biblical idea, the light dark? Well, it's interesting. You know, you should ask that because um, it doesn't play itself out 
entirely that way, you know, in some indigenous cultures. Um, partly because in many, in some of the indigenous cultures, uh, uh, there's more of a, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, a tendency to stay closer to nature. Yeah. And, um, and to see kind of an experience kind of like the, the oneness with nature. Yeah. So the tendency to, toward uh, doing a lot of um, demarcating and arbitrarily demarcating, uh, there's a less tendency to do that. But you can still find that, you know, in some indigenous cultures. Um, uh, and many indigenous cultures are homogeneous. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, we happen to be, you know, very visually oriented creatures. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as visually oriented creatures, we focus on the immediacy of what we may be seeing um, with our senses. Yeah. Uh, so um, when you step outside of that mm -hmm. homogeneity, is where these these distinctions then begin to emerge in consciousness and mm. uh, and uh, the mind wonders what that's about, mm. um, you know. So uh, there, you know, and sometimes they have uh, the shock experience. For example, there's some indig indigenous cultures who step out, folks who step outside of the indigenous culture, and they go into a mainstream and they go. Wait a minute! <laughs> I'm being viewed differently than the way I thought. Yeah. Uh, and what's this about? Um, yeah. And uh, and then they get cast into some of the uh, the color codes, you know, that exist uh, from a Western point of view. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and they're off and running. Um, so. When you do have a more of a homogeneous kind of grouping that happens, you get less of that tendency. Mm -hmm. But then if you introduce mm -hmm. a different coloration into that mix, it stirs up things and people get all kinds of things. Yeah. Like even in, uh, even in Ukraine right now, mm -hmm. if you listen to some of the, the the, the stories that are coming out of that, those who are darker complex are having trouble and across the border. And, and across yeah. the border. Uh -huh. uh, even during this turmoil uh, yeah. that, that's happening. So uh, yeah. it just it's it's just there in the consciousness at this point. Mm -hmm. And the question is how do you how do you begin to to heal it? And I began I began to talk a little bit about that by trying to deal with the first order business having to do with, uh, with the security issues that people uh, may be experiencing. And mm -hmm. lots of the, unfortunately, many of the folks that, I'm pausing here because I don't want to say this in a way that it's not judgmental. Um, some of the folks who have been involved in leadership roles or acting out of uh, the, or playing out and acting out the security human race game. Uh, so even if you listen to how Putin, Putin for example, view, his worldview yeah. uh, is coming out of a, an insecure space. Yeah, um, I see it. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, so that's one of the games that we play is around the security. The other has to do with the one that that get gets linked in, it, and I call it the uh, uh, sensorial um, human race game, which has to do with how we how we use our five senses, and then and then the the most um, pronounce one that, that fuels a lot of what we're engaged in the humanities occasion is what I call the power human race game, uh, where uh, 
lots of ego stuff is happening around that one. Uh, and people get uh, I'm sure that so so this is in your book, uh, yeah. the Human it's, Race Game. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sure you can you elaborate a lot more on all these things. It sounds very very intriguing, very appreciative. So uh, at a very practical down here level, um, I think you've. I, I saw an allusion to an article in the Boston Globe where maybe you had talked about reparations and uh, um, how does how does that fit with um, your your deeper understanding of, of the causes of racism and and its solutions uh, yeah. healing. Well, thank you for that question. Um, uh, let me say that that the whole idea around reparation work is really, if you really look at that word, it's really about repair, <laughs> repair work. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, what's going on in the Boston area, for example, right now is that um, uh, I'm engaged with some community folks who are trying to get a, uh, a commission uh, on reparation commissions uh, together through the Boston City Council. Uh, and, um, and there had been some resistance to even putting together a commission. I bet. <laughs> uh, and we finally, uh, finally uh, got to a point where um, we were able to at one of the Boston City Councilors to say, yeah, I'm going to put forward this proposal. Uh, and um, so it's, it's going through the process at the moment. But the in many ways, the reparation work is really a metaphor for having deeper dialogue. Um, and I call we call them healing dialogues around race matters, race linked matters. Uh, so that uh, it's not about necessarily, um, you know, when people hear the word reparations, it's not about money per se. It's really about how do you, how do you begin to bring the issues around equity um, into conversations that are race linked? And how do you begin to have people to do that in an, in an open and authentic way? And how do you begin to people to begin to have people who are in seats of authority at the moment uh, to try to make a difference from their seats? And we make a distinction between um, power and authority. Authority is something that's delegated, and power is something that's demonstrated. Authority, it's delegated in the sense that those who are in the current seats, at least in, the, in democracy as it's currently, um, we put them there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they are in delegated roles, you know, at the moment. Um, and how they play out those roles has a lot to do with their mindsets and their consciousness and so forth. Um, but they're in delegated roles. Uh, and what we're saying with the with the reparations work, however, is that uh, we want, we're trying to get people to to act in a different way <laughs> around race linked matters, or race linked issues, uh, and to do that more uh, both uh, in structural ways uh, and to some extent in multicultural ways so that people can begin to have some authentic dialogues and develop a more of a, a comprehensive way of understanding who they are. Now, underneath that for me, however, um, which I don't necessarily talk a lot about it, underneath that for me is, is really more about uh, assisting folks to understand the kind of soul dramas that we're involved in and to see have, have people to sort of get to the point of understanding that I may be a sole actor in your drama and you may be a sole actor in my drama. 
And if we begin to, to um, sort of see these as uh, interdependent dramas that we're enacting to try to learn some things, to try to grow, to try to expand our consciousness, it's a different kind of order of business in terms of how we play our external games together. Encouraging you know, to have awareness of the soul connections and what we're what they want us the souls so to speak to to learn from our encounters with each other yeah is that a way of saying it especially across these differences that are perceived just differences yeah on us yeah yeah so our souls you know in many ways our souls uh, if our souls have you know a lot more awareness than, <laughs> than our surface personalities but you know this is where we are so we have to you know you have to deal with where, where where you happen to be in your own level of consciousness without ch judging it uh and um uh and each of us in our own way are trying to learn certain things um you know and they're on the planet right now we have some baby souls <laughs> uh we have some infant souls we have uh uh, some adolescent souls, so to speak, and we have uh, uh, we have some mature souls, and we got uh, we got some old souls. <laughs> old souls, yeah. And each has a perspective to add and to contribute, and uh -huh. some are aware of of uh -huh. where they are in their own developmental process, and some are not. <laughs> and uh, and somehow we have to make that okay. <laughs> Uh, for people being exactly where they are, because they can't be in a place that they're not. <laughs> but you also need, we also are trying to create the opportunities for souls to grow. You know, in this current reality. Uh, and they even have aspects of our souls to come into this current physical reality. Uh, now, that may be a hard proposition to entertain <laughs> uh but that's also part of what it means to mature well, it uh, certainly goes back to your your first doorway into all of this well intellectually at least which was so self speaks so to speak. <laughs> <That's, exactly. laughs> and now you know to say self speaks in the Jungian sense that 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 makes sense too like the self being the higher uh, part of ourselves, the true nature of our being. Well, there's an irony yeah. there. Yeah. Irony there for me too, because yeah. uh, and I said this in one, one in the last book. I said, you know, after doing that and and hearing that the the first book as self speaks, and then I ultimately became a professor, uh -huh. <laughs> where myself didn't begin to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> yeah, so there, this has been so rich, and I have very much have enjoyed uh, this conversation with you and uh, look forward to sending it out uh, to my networks and uh, maybe attracting people more to your um, work, your writings, your books, your talks. And, uh, and um, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I have to and, keep uh, these somewhat time limited because people look at a long. Oh, I can't watch that. Yeah, I'm, yep. I have too many emails to check. <laughs> so, but I deeply appreciate our conversation. Thank you, Cook. Thank you. Blessings to you. You too. I'll end.